in. A little prelude to the backdrop on this. Again, we'll be looking at 2 Samuel uh, chapters 11 and 12, if you want to uh, find that place in, in your Bibles. Um, but leading up to this, David is now uh, firmly entrenched as the king of Judah and Israel. Uh, he has been anointed king over, over all the tribes, over the entire nation. Um, he has moved the ark into the city of Jerusalem. It's in a tabernacle that he's built that's uh, been built to house the ark. So it's, it's now brought into the city. And he is, it's kind of like he's got peace, momentarily anyway, uh, throughout the land. And so where we're at is David sends an envoy to the people of Ammon. And what's happened is that uh, in chapter 10, verse 1, it tells us that it happened after this, after this, that the king of the people of Ammon died and Hanan, his son, reigns in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David had a good relationship with the king of Ammon. And when he died, he wanted to continue that relationship. So he, he wanted to extend that to his son. And so he sent some, an envoy down there, some emissaries, some ambassadors and representatives to the, the people of Ammon to, to give his condolences to the son and uh, let them know that, that he was still their friend. Well, the king, king's son, who is now the ruler over the, uh, the people of Ammon, uh, his counselors came to him. And they told him, you know, the only reason he sent those guys here is so that they can spy out the land, so they can get the lay of the city, so that he can come in and overthrow you. Well, the king listened to his counselors, and so he wasn't very kind to David's emissaries or his envoys when they came in. In fact, he... he pulled them to the side. He had them forcibly restrained. They shaved off half their beards, which is, is a pretty big insult because back at that day and time, the, it wasn't just a fashion statement. The, the every, every male wore a beard. It was, um, it was how people appeared back then. It was also a, a sign of, of, a, of a man's masculinity and, and, uh, uh, to have it shaved off was like a, a is just like something he would not have done on his own. So it was, it was a, um, uh, I can't think of the right word. It was an insult to those men. And it was also an insult to King David. And then to make matters even worse, they decided that they were going to cut out the, the seat of the clothes all the guys wore. So they were walking around mooning everybody as they, you know, as they went around, and so they were greatly embarrassed and greatly ashamed, and and they sent word to to David, and he was he was livid to say the least. Here he was sending an envoy to these people, uh, telling them that they were going to continue in a in an open um, and friendly relationship, and they do this to those he sends down to his ambassadors. And uh, the word says, when the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, the people of Ammon sent and they hired Syrians from Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and from the king of Makkah, 1,000 men, and from Ishtob, 12,000 men. So the people of Ammon, the, the rulers there, they hired 33,000 Syrians to come up and, and stand with them. Uh, if they are, were to fight with the Israelites. And when King David heard that, that they were lining up for battle, he sent his entire army down to Ammon with, with Joab, with his commander. And so Joab goes into the field against the city, and, and when he lines up against the city, the Syrians come up behind him, so he sees he's got a battle uh, ground in front and a battle line behind. But he, he perseveres, he, he um, comes through, very well. He defeats the Syrians and they flee and the people of Ammon, they, they return into the city. So he's, he's defeated both armies. And I guess maybe the, the people of Ammon didn't pay the Syrians enough money because they didn't stand and fight very long. They took off. And so Job withdrew and returned to Jerusalem. Now, when he returned to Jerusalem, the, the king of Zobah of the Syrians, King Hadadezer, he decided that he best pull the, his armies back together. So he, he, he reunites his army and he brings in Syrians from all over the, the, the Syrian uh, nation there and brings them up to line them up against the Israelites again. So when King David hears about it, he sends Job out again 
and uh, they come against him. Actually, uh, yeah, he's, he stays home and he sends the, the armies out against them. And again, they, they defeat the Syrians. They flee. The word says that, that they made peace with Israel and served them. They, they offered themselves in servitude to the people of Israel. And says, so the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Ammon anymore. They made peace and, and they, they just decided that, you know, we've, we've had enough with, with our, our friendship with Ammon. It hasn't got us anywhere. You know, don't call us, we'll call you type situation. So again, starting now with chapter 11. And this is the, the, one of the chapters about David's shortcomings. It's probably, hey, Jesse, good to see you. Uh, hey, Mary, Miss Mary. They, this is um, one of his biggest shortcomings, one of his biggest failings. It's the one that when people talk about the, the sin of uh, King David, this is the sin. This is it. Okay. So we start in chapter 11 and verse 1. And the word says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. But David sent Joab, Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Okay. Verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. Okay. David should have been in the battlefield with his men. In the spring, when the time when the kings go out to battle, David stayed home. And... and there wasn't a whole lot going on that, you know, well, nothing really good on TV at that time. Not a lot of specials and no, no games or anything to take uh, to watch. So David gets up one night and wanders around on his rooftop. Um, it says, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Um, I think this was probably where the bathtubs on the roofs ended. I, I think, you know, um, this is just not what you do. You don't put bathtubs on your rooftops. But anyway, at this point in time, I guess they did. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Church David was in a place where he shouldn't have been. It, it, he should have been out on the battlefield, not um, walking around on his rooftop. Uh, he was where he shouldn't have been. And, and I think most of us can all agree at some point in time in our life, we've been um, in places where we shouldn't have been. Um, I think almost everybody can agree to that. There have been times we were places that we just shouldn't have been. We just shouldn't have been there. Um, and a lot of times when those things occur, we get in trouble. So it's best to avoid those places where you know you shouldn't be. All right. So, um, so David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite. A word about Uriah. If you look over in, in uh, chapter 25 of 2 Samuel, verse 39, it mentions him. And the chapter discusses David's mighty men, the, the people that were his, his commanders, his champions, those people who had been with him for years, the, the ones who met him in the wilderness and, and came to him when there was nobody else fighting his battles. They came to him and stood with him. And Uriah was among those, the first to come to him. And he's mentioned in this chapter. In fact, he's the last one mentioned as having been one of the champions of David. So Uriah has been with David for a while. They've gotten close. They know each other well. And David sees this woman, and she turns out to be the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And verse 4 says, Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Okay, church, of all the things that David could have done, in this instance, he didn't do anything right. Number one, he has this woman brought to him, knowing that she's the wife of Uriah, knowing she's the wife of somebody who's been loyal to him for a period of time, for years, and has stood at his side and fought his battles with him. And he gives in to the lusts of the flesh. He gives in to his weakness, has her brought to him. Uh, they lay together. Um, he sends her back home. 
And lo and behold, she sends word and says, I am a child. So David's trying to figure out, now what do I do? Um, this is Uriah. What do I do? He starts thinking about it and he comes up with this plan. And it says in verse 6, it says, Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Job was doing, uh, how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. He made small talk. They made conversation. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. So at the time when David maybe should have said, Uriah, sit down, you and I need to talk, um, and maybe confess to sin, knowing that there would have been re repercussions, instead he decided to do some, some scheming in uh so he, he says to him, you know, um, go go home, go go clean up, have a bath, wash your feet, um, have some dinner. I'll send dinner down. We'll have it catered to you. Uh, probably a little wine along with the dinner. Go home and, and and see see the wife, see see your family. Again, probably not the wisest course of action. The word says, so Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David was kind of like, uh, what? <laughs> I, I, I had everything planned. I, what? Why? And so when they told him, told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And listen to the words of Uriah. And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and, Joah and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab, my Lord Joab, and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this. Church, Uriah was a man of noble character. Uriah was a man of integrity. He was a man of honor. Um, and while the army was in the field, the army that he was assigned to, he wasn't going to go take a holiday with his wife. He wasn't going to take leave. He came there at, at the instructions of his king. And when he was uh, allowed to leave, he was going back to the battlefield. And so David's thinking, okay, I got to take another stab at this. So then David said to Uriah, wait here today also. And tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah made, remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Again, because of who he is, he wasn't, he wasn't going to do that. He was serving his king with the army. And his position needed to be in the field. So the word says in chapter 14, it says, In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So Uriah is returning to the battlefield with the letter to Joab giving Joab instructions to send him into the thick of the fight and to retreat from him. It's instructions to have him killed. And Joab carries his own, uh, the order for his own death to Joab. 
And verse 16 says, So it was while Job besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. And then the men of the city came out and fought with Job. And some of the people of the servant, of servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died, died also. So David's plan didn't just impact Uriah. It impacted a number of, of other people, of other people of Israel, who died in the battlefield with Uriah. In verse 18, Then Job sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in, Je in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Job set up the conversation with the intent of bringing the wrath of David so that he could then shut him down by telling him, I was following your directions. I followed your instructions. This is your doing. Verse 22, So the messenger went and came and told David all that Job had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came back to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the walls at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. The messenger had his own plan. He knew the the uh, he knew what Job had done, why why he had set up his conversation that way, and the messenger did not want to incur the wrath of the king. So he told him up front. He didn't take him down the trail. He told him up front that um, some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. In verse twenty-five, then David said to the messenger. Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. Does it seem to you that, that King David's a little too casual in this? That he uh, is kind of callous? Um... It's almost as if there, it, it's just very cold for him to respond in this manner. He does not appear to have um, any remorse, um, no, no conscience about what has transpired. And this is a man who stood by him and fought with him, fought his battles for him. I, I, this is one of those places where I, I, you don't understand how another man could do such a thing. In verse 26, it says, When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. David thinks everything's done. It's all tidied up. It's all neat. No one would ever know. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Everything was tidied up and no one would ever know but God. In chapter 12, verse 1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. 
It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to eat. He took this man and his children's lamb, had it slaughtered, and prepared for a meal. The word says in verse 5, So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he still shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you desp despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversary, adversity against you from your own home. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with them with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to the house. Church David had sinned, and even though he, he, can, he confessed his sin when he was confronted, there were still consequences to be paid. And the Lord did strike down the child of, of Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. The wife she bore to David, the child became ill. And David pled with the Lord in, in uh, for the child, and he fasted, and he went in, and he, and he laid all night on the ground, and the elders of the house arose and, and went to him and, and encouraged him to come and eat, and, and but he wouldn't. And on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died, and the servants were afraid to tell him. Well, they said, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. It says, David heard his servants whispering, and and perceived that the child was dead. And so he asked them, is the child dead? And they said, he is. So then David arose from the ground. He washed and anointed himself. He changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. And then when he left there, he went to his own house and he had food prepared and he sat down and ate. And his servant said to him, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and you ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Church, in this two chapters, David has committed murder. He's committed adultery. He has deceived a friend, he has coveted his friend's wife, and he stole his wife from him. At this point in time, the things that David has done is, is the lowest of the low. And I think part of the reason why it's in the Word and, and for us to read is to say that here is a man who was anointed by the Lord to be king. Yes, he went through difficulties. He went through trials and tribulations, but he persevered and he was set upon the throne and he became the king. He did as the Lord had established for him to do. And the Lord calls him a man after his own heart. 
And yet David fell, and he fell hard. Church, no man, (laughs) no man is exempt from sin. No man is exempt from temptation. No man is exempt from the lust of the flesh. No man, no woman, doesn't matter how high up they are perceived to be, doesn't matter what platform they stand on, what level, doesn't matter what their position in in the government, in the church, in in the school system is, it doesn't matter. No man is exempt. And we all have temptations and we all have battles to fight and we all have to fight them. This is, this is, this is crazy for a man of his standing to fall so low. But when he was confronted, he, he, he came back to his right mind. He confessed his sin and he repented. And he wrote Psalms 51 at the end of this. I want to read this to you, and I want you to hear the words of this man who has has looked upon what he has done, who has seen the consequences of what he's done, and remember his prayer. Hopefully none of us are going to be in the state that, that David was in. None of us are going to be in the position that we've committed such atrocities against not just the, 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 the man Uriah, but against the people of the nation. Against other families, other men died in the battle with Uriah because Joab had withdrew their support. So hopefully none of us will ever be in this situation. Listen to the words of David that he writes in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's asking the Lord to do these things for him. He knows that that he's, he's not in a position to do it himself. He knows that he can't do it himself. He says to the Lord, have mercy on me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me. Cleanse me. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. He's acknowledged his sin. He's acknowledged his transgressions. He's come to the place where he knows and he understands. He can't hide it from the Lord. The Lord's aware. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Sometimes I think we use that as an excuse for our sin, saying that, you know, I'm sorry, we're all sinners, we're all born into sin, you know, but we're all given the opportunity. You know, the, the Lord always offers a way out. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. I checked in the concordance for the inward parts there, kind of wondering what, what he's referring to there. In inward parts, the original uh, Hebrew word also refers to inner thoughts. So I'm, I'm wondering if it wasn't, behold your desired truth in our inner thoughts. In our own deep thoughts, you, you desire truth to be found there. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. And I pulled up the hidden part, and it's it's talked about uh, close and secret. So it's those thoughts, those things that we hold close and hold dear, and the thoughts in our brains, and he says, and in that part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. I checked hyssop, and hyssop is used today. It's still being used. It's a, it's a healing ingredient. People use it for sore throats and, and for colds. For hoarseness, it's an expectorant. It's used with people who have, have asthma. Um, it's used on skin rashes and on wounds cuts. And it's also used as a, as a cleansing bath. You can you can soak in it. It's kind of like soaking in Epsom salts, I guess. It does. It brings healing to the body. 
So, so purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. I looked at bones as well and, it, and the word means bones, body, and life. So you could also read it, make me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice, that the life you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And to blot out means to erase, to wipe away. And this is one of the most favorite life, uh, most well-known lines of scripture. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steady, steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, Joe Sarvis, Brother Joe and I were talking the other day and uh, talking about someone finding themselves in that position. And Joe just broke down and he cried and, and he said, Lord, I don't ever want to be in that place. Don't ever, Lord, let me be in that place where you cast me away. Never let me be in that place where you take your Holy Spirit from me. David continues and says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and, and sinners shall be converted to you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You know, we often say to people, remember your, your first love. Remember the joy when you first gave your life to Christ. Remember how great it felt when you received Christ. And I think that's what he's referring to. Restore to me that joy. Restore to me that, that, that wonder, that, that, that feeling of knowing I'm saved, of knowing that I have salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. He's, he's making a commitment to the Lord. Restore that joy to me, and I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners, Lord, sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud to your righteousness, of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you did not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You did not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. You know, church, in the eyes of the Lord, no one sin is worse than any other. The Lord talks more about gossip in the Bible than he does about murder and adultery. We make, we make um, sin to have different levels. Murder is much worse than stealing, and stealing is much worse than lying. But in the eyes of God, all sin is sin. And that's one thing we need to remember. When, when, when we've messed up, when we've fallen short, when we've, when we've fallen and, and, and gotten our knees dirty, yes, we stand up, we dust them off, and we hold our head up and we walk on. But we repent and we seek forgiveness from the Lord. And we do it in a manner like this. We don't say, Lord, Josh, I messed up. Man, would you forgive me? I would appreciate it. I won't do it again, Lord. I really, really won't. I won't do it again if you'll just, if you'll just forgive me. You know, there's no remorse there. And I read through this psalm and, and he says, have mercy on me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me. Cleanse me. Purge me. Wash me. Make me hear joy. Hide your, your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me away. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me. Deliver me. Open my lips. He knows he's not in a place where he should, where he should be attempting these things. And he's asking the Lord to do them for him. He is, he's not in a place where he can wash his sin away. Only God can do that. And the good news that we have is that Jesus Christ came, and we talked last week about his, his death and his resurrection. Jesus Christ came for us that we might be washed by his blood, that we might be, uh, we might receive the sacrifice that he made that we might be reconciled to our God. By his sacrifice, we are reconciled to God. By his blood, we are washed clean. We can't, we can't wash away our sin, but the blood of Christ can. And for anybody out there tonight who's listening, anybody that may be listening tomorrow, 
If that place comes, if you you find yourself in that place where you have messed up and you just don't know how you can ever make it right, how you can ever make it up to the Lord, here it is right here in Psalm 51. Here's a sinner's prayer saying, Lord, I have messed up, but I know the Lord that you can wash me clean. I know by the blood of the Lamb, I am am cleansed. My sin is, is washed away. Here's your pattern. Pray this prayer over yourself. And there's, a, there's those out there who are in this spot, even today. I just feel it in my heart. Maybe that's why the Lord really placed this upon my heart today. I've, I've spent a lot of time today looking through this. Your sin is never so grievous that you can't bring it before the Lord and find forgiveness. But you have to be sincere and you have to, to, you have to be remorseful of it. It's not okay just to say, God, I'm really sorry I messed up. Forgive me? If you've sinned against the Lord, it's a serious matter. But he is quick to forgive. His mercies are new every day. Come before the Lord. Acknowledge your sin. Repent of your sin and ask forgiveness, and he is quick to forgive. Our God loves us, each and every one of us. He sent his son to die for us because he loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have life everlasting. That's God's desire for us. In closing out in Psalm 51, the word says, Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. It seems like he's changed direction at the end of, of the psalm. It's like all of a sudden he's 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 gone from, from a broken and contrite heart to, to, Lord, do good in your good pleasure. But he's in the place where he can do that. He's in the place where he is able to do that because he has become before the Lord. He's asked to be cleansed. He's asked for the Lord to take away his sin. He's asked for him to, to restore him to the joy of your salvation. I've done, Lord, what I know to be the right things to do. And so therefore, Lord, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness. We shall put this behind us. Because you see, the king represents the land. The king represents the people. And he's telling the Lord, we shall put our sin behind us. We shall put our iniquities behind us, Lord. And you, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. Because a righteous man is one who's in right standing with the Lord. And a righteous man can present a sacrifice of righteousness. Church, I don't know who this was for tonight, but I know that there was somebody out there who needs to hear it. And I don't know if it's somebody from the church. I don't know that it's a, a guest tuning in tonight or, or somebody that may watch it later in the week. But if it's for you, Psalm 51 is your prayer. Read it over yourself. And know and understand that the Lord is quick to forgive. He is he's quick to hear. He's quick to respond. He's quick to restore the joy of your salvation. Don't let your sin, your sin stand between you and the Lord. Cry out to him. He's there. Again, I, I, I hope whoever this was for takes it to heart tonight and uh, uh, responds in kind. Uh, to the message, to the Bible study tonight. Again, please start reading chapter 13. Uh, we will bring the message on Sunday out of, uh, out of chapter 12 in the book, The Story. Um, Kathy will have a Bible study on uh, Friday at 2 o'clock. So if you're available, if you've, got, you know, if you've got nothing else going on, Make time to sit with Kathy in this. There's studies that she's been doing are really good. She's doing a study on prayer. 
Uh, so make time to be there. Again, please keep Sister Lolly in your prayers. Um, thank you, Philip, for your for your note there. Um, and let's close in prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, I, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your word. You laid it upon me as, as a heavy burden, Lord, to, to bring this tonight. I pray, Lord, that, that whoever it was for, that their hearts open, that they, they have good soul, that they receive what is, what is there, and they sow it in the seed that was sown, they sow that seed into their life. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you be with each and every person here tonight. Lead, guide, and direct our path, Lord. Father, if any of us are in error or if there's a sin that, that has, has come up that stands between us and you, if, if we're walking in, in a pathway that you would not have us walk, Lord God, I, I pray that you would bring us revelation, that you would speak to us and speak to our hearts, Lord, and show us where we're in error, Lord, that, that we can make the, the, the right choices and that we can turn from that path that we're on and, and turn back to the path that takes us to the foot of the cross. I pray, Lord, if anybody here be in sin and, and, and maybe don't recognize it, Lord, or they're in such a place that, that, that they deny it themselves, that you will put people, places, things in their pathway, Lord, that will steer them in the right direction. Father, I pray that you will show us people that, that we need to be praying for and people we need to speak to and, and people we need to show the love of Christ to, that we become ambassadors this week, Lord, and, and regardless of what the cost is, Lord, that we will do what it is that you've called us to do. We will speak the words that you've called us to speak, Lord God. Father, we lift up Sister Lolly to you, Lord. Father, we know in whom we have believed. We know, Lord God, that... that by your stripes, we are healed, not by the stripes of doctors or, or, or nurses, Lord God, but by your stripes, we are healed. So, Father, I, I just pray and lift up Lolly to you and, and, and Bobby and, and her children, Lord Robert, and the, the I'm sorry, I can't remember the daughter's name, but, but Lord, you know. And Father, I just ask you that you just be that healing balm upon them. Bring healing to Lolly, Lord God, and, and bring comfort and, and peace to her family. Uh, Lord, just just pour out your presence upon them, upon their home, Lord. And, and Father, they're standing in faith, and we partner with them in faith as well, believing, Lord God, that that, that you will bring uh, a conclusion to this. We're praying that you just rebuke the spirit of infirmity, that you rebuke the cancer, Lord God. And Father, we speak life over Lolly. We, we rebuke the spirit ourselves. We rebuke the spirit of infirmity. Spirit, you have no hold upon her. Your place is denied you. You have no, no room there anymore. You must depart in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of, of mankind, the Savior of the world. His Spirit speaks and cries out against you. You must depart. And we thank you, Lord, for your, for your presence and for your healing spirit and your, and your hand being upon Lolly. Father God, we just thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. So church, we wish everybody a good, peaceful night. You all sleep well. Uh, I'll be calling and talking to you. Again, if you, if you see the, you, you hear your phone ring and you look and it says the pastor is calling, um, just know I'm calling to, to check on you and, and see how you're doing. Uh, if there's any prayer requests that you have, please send them to us so that we can add them to the list. Um, we love you. We miss you. Again, that day is coming. We'll be high-fiving and hugging and drinking coffee together. Um, I'm looking forward to that day. I just hunger for that time with you guys and look forward to it. Y'all have a good night. We love you all. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.